Welcome back, everyone. And now it's time to welcome on our virtual stage our next keynote speaker, Stephen van Belleghem. He is a customer centricity expert at Belgium. His passion is spreading ideas about the future of customer experience. Stephen believes in the combination of common sense, new technologies, and empathetic human touch, where companies play the long-term game and take social responsibility to win the hearts and business of customers repeatedly. Conversing with him will be Ravi Raman, our editorial director at MarTech Vibe, who he himself is a renowned media professional in the Middle East, and he has worked with brands such as New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, Vogue, and Khalid Times, to name a few. Quite impressive. Over to you, Ravi. Welcome, Stephen. Let me dive right in. Stephen, what makes a company customer-centric? And how can the leadership find out? That, that's a crucial question. And, and I think that most leadership people would say that they would try to uh, look at the statistics, uh, figure out how their customer satisfaction scores are doing and how the net promoter score is. And, and I agree uh, that, that those are valuable insights. But personally, I like to use more qualitative questions that almost work like a a, a sounding board back to the leadership to see how they would react to certain situations. Sometimes that learns you more about how customer centric you are. And, and one of the questions I always ask is, how does your company react when you're dealing with an opposing interest? Uh, when, when the interest for me as a customer is different than for you as a company. Like there are many telco companies that have sleeping accounts. People have a subscription, but they're not using it anymore. How do you deal with that? Because people are actually paying for something that is not bringing them value. So that's not really customer centric. Even though most telcos that I know, they just let people sleep in those accounts because they're like, they signed the contract. And as long as they don't stop the contract, we're not doing anything wrong. And technically that's right. But from a customer point of view, I don't know if that's the most customer centric approach. So how do you deal with opposing interest? That's one question. The second question is, what happens when a mistake occurs? Uh, mistakes happen every day. And we all know that that's an opportunity if something goes wrong to even make the customer happier. But even though we all know that, the majority of the organizations almost conduct some sort of a research project before they start to help the customer because they want to find out who made a mistake, why was a mistake made, what can we learn from that? And I understand that the value of, of that learning process but in the meantime you're frustrating your customer because they didn't they, they don't get the help that they actually want so really customer centric cust uh, companies they see the mistake the first thing they do is they fix the mistake and after that they start that learning process and i think that's the right mentality so question number two is how do you react in a situation like that and the third question that will make you understand your customer centricity better is Think about how empowered your frontline staff is. Um, how far can people go to actually help out um, clients? Uh, and, and when is that point that someone in the frontline will say, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. I have to call my manager. And if there's one sentence that customers do not want to hear, it's, I'm going to call my manager because then as a customer, you know, this is not going to end up well for me because there's some guy somewhere that will look at me as a number instead of a person, and that won't work out. So the, the, the more freedom, the more empowerment your frontline staff has to actually help customers, the more customer-centric you are. And, and I would invite everyone who's, who's attending today to think about these three questions and how they react with them. The opposing interest, what if something goes wrong, and how empowered is the frontline staff? And the answer to those questions will learn you a lot about how customer-centric you actually are. So as a follow-up, do you think that leadership should be asking these questions constantly? What's the process they should follow? Well, I, I, I think one of the most crucial aspects for leadership is to stay in touch with real customers. Uh, don't make decisions based on Excel sheets and statistics only. Because if, if you're starting to make decisions only based on statistics about your customers, you're like dehumanizing your, your customer. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a soccer fan. I, li I live in Belgium, as you know, and I'm a soccer fan of, uh, of Club Bruges here, the team in Belgium. 
And um, during the pandemic, I, I watched a lot of games on TV in empty soccer stadiums. And I thought that it was really, really boring. And you felt that there was a different kind of energy. And I started to think about this. And I really understand it now because soccer players are professionals that operate in a world of real-time customer feedback. If they do something right, they get applause. If they do something bad, they get booed at. When they score, it's like an explosion of emotions. So imagine that you would have a job where there is like real-time customer feedback. Like imagine our conversation now. Every time that I say something that people like, that they applaud, if they say something, if they think I'm saying something really stupid that I get booed at, I mean, it would change the dynamics in our conversation. So the, the fact that you have access to that customer feedback changes your behavior. And I think that is an, an important part in the process for, for leadership teams to make sure that they don't take decisions in empty soccer stadiums, but that they try to get as close as possible to the customer. And, and the best way to do that, in my opinion, is one-on-one is -on -one conversations, organizing right. moments where you see customers and where you can actually ask them in person about how they feel about your customer centricity. That's, that's very interesting. And let me tell you, Stephen, we haven't got any boost yet. We've all, all got positive responses, as I can see. Okay, you also mentioned that this is the largest digital training force the world has ever seen. Explain that a bit and how has it impacted CX and digital experiences? Yeah, well, you know, March 2020 changed the, changed the world and especially the digital world um, because we didn't have another choice than to move the biggest part of our lives um, to, to a digital platform, professionally, but also privately, also to, you know, buy food, to get uh, access to our friends. We need a digital channel. So in like two or three weeks time, suddenly the entire world got familiar with video calls, with online events, with online grocery shopping. All these things just happened in a few weeks time. I, I saw this graph um, of the e-commerce evolution in the United States. And in the first eight weeks of the pandemic, e-commerce grew faster than in the 10 years before that. And e-commerce was already a rapid growing industry, but then in eight weeks, they grew faster than in the 10 years before that. So I call that the biggest digital training course in human history. We didn't have a choice, so we had to learn and, and all of us did. And because of that, the impact on CX is, is quite significant because today people know what works and doesn't work. And we can get really frustrated if something doesn't work as it potentially could work. So I think that today we live in some sort of a zero tolerance for digital inconvenience world, meaning that me as a customer, I am not willing to invest my precious time in your digital incompetence. So the, the bar is a lot higher there. And because of that, I always invite everyone to become what I call friction hunters in their own organization, where you try to go through the process of the customer as often as possible. And you look for small details that you know, could be done better, small frictions where you waste the time of people, where you make it too complex, where they have to do your job. All these examples are frictions. And the more people in an organization that actually become a friction hunter, the, the, the better it will be for your CX. Now, the, the one thing that we need to acknowledge is that you know, digital convenience has become a commodity because of this. And that means that it will not allow you to win the race. Between 2010 and 2020, digital convenience made sure that you could win the race. Today, it is the ticket to stay in the race. And I think that's a different mindset that we need to be aware of as CX professionals. That's, that's fascinating. Now I'm going to take one audience question here. Okay. Which is very interesting. How can brands go beyond customer journey to truly add value? And which brands are doing this well? I, I love that question. Uh, we, we've been focusing in CX a lot on customer experience, uh, customer journeys, apologies, on customer journeys and trying to optimize every touch point. And that works really well. I'm a, I'm a fan and believer in that. So no problem there. The only thing is there's, there's probably a larger opportunity if we go beyond the transactional part. Our customer journeys make you optimize the transactional relationship. The challenge, in my opinion, is to create value in what I call the life journey of customers. And asking yourself the question, how can you create positive change 
in the life of customers? How can you add value in the day-to-day -day life of a customer? Uh, and, and the better you understand that everyone has like a movie of, of their life in the back of their minds with all the dreams and all the wishes, all the hopes and all the fears, the better you understand that, the more value you will be able to bring in, in the life journey. And, you know, in, in my opinion, creating digital convenience, optimizing customer journeys is perfect to create a transactional relationship that is really, really strong, adding value in the life journey creates a more emotional relationship that you will build with your customers. And that's where the opportunity is for the next couple of years. And do you want to share some best case studies or a brand that's really done it well? Sure, sure, with pleasure. Um, one of my favorites is actually a local European company called Upgrade Estate. They are in, they are in real estate and their focus is to build apartments for students. So when students go to the university, they can, they can stay there. It's like a student community. Um, and of course they make beautiful rooms and they wanna rent them out, but they go beyond asking so much money per square meter. That's a transactional part of renting out an apartment. What they try to do is become a partner in a successful start of a career of students. So they were like, okay, what do students need and how can we help them to have a successful start in their career? So one of the things that they've done is in each of the buildings that they have is they have a mental coach available 24 seven uh, because students, a lot of people think that students are, are party animals. And in many cases they are, but there's more to a student than just that. A lot of students feel lonely, for instance, um, when they're moving into a new apartment and they don't have any friends there, or they are afraid for the exams or there are tensions between people in those buildings. I mean, a lot can happen. So they make sure that there's a mental coach available that can help out in those conversations to make sure that everyone feels well. They have psychologists available. So if students feel uncertain for the exams that they can give them mental support. Um, they created what they call the Upgrade Academy where they offer students the opportunity to come to network events or to have presentations of, of cool speakers where they actually learn things that you don't learn on the student benches, but that help you to have a successful start in your career. So, I mean, I could talk an hour about these guys, but you feel that they go beyond that transactional part. They go beyond making sure that we have a nice building with nice rooms and, and everything that we need to have there. They go for that emotional part. How can we create positive change in your life as a student? And I love those kind of, that kind of mindset. And it's, you know, there, there are not that many companies that are already focusing on that. I think there's a huge opportunity. If you, if you think, for instance, towards, towards banks, the uh, question is, are you a bank or are you a partner for a worry-free financial future? If you're the owner of a gym, are you an owner of a gym or can you become a partner in a healthy lifestyle? And, and what you're starting to see is that some companies leave their lanes for that. You know, in the past, the retailer was a retailer, a bank was a bank. Now you see how companies are leaving their lanes. There's an example of a company, a fashion company called Lululemon, and they want to make sure that everyone looks well and, and looks beautiful. And they have, yeah, they designed cool fashion for that that is available and is accessible at a moderate price. But now they made an acquisition a couple of months ago of a company called Smart Mirror, where they were as a customer of Lululemon, you can now buy this mirror in your house and it's like a smart mirror for, for working out. So they make sure that they add that service to make sure that you look good, not just with the fashion items that they sell, but also because you take care of your body and you're doing the working out. So you see how a retailer now becomes a, a, a healthcare coach. And it's that evolution that I find really interesting. How can you move from optimizing the customer journey to adding value in a broader perspective in people's life in a positive way. So, and these are inspiring stories, Stephen. So why do you think more and more brands are not taking this path? Why aren't they leaving their lanes? Uh, why, why they're not leaving their lanes or what? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it feels scary for a lot of them. And, and truth is also that even though I'm saying that digital convenience is a commodity and customer journey optimization is, is part of the transactional part, the, the truth is that still a lot of companies have a lot of work to do there. Uh, so no one's perfect yet. And a lot of companies feel that they need to be perfect first before they move to a next level. I tend to disagree with that. I mean, you, you don't have to be really bad, but, but you never, optimizing customer journeys is never finished. 
uh, having the best digital convenience is never finished. You're never going to be perfect. It's it's an ongoing journey. So if you wait until that's perfect because you go before you go to the next level, my fear is that you will never get there. So mm -hmm. it's it's like playing those those two games at the same time is going to be a challenge. And a lot of companies has also have also learned we need to stick to the core. And the core was we're in a specific industry. I still believe we need to stick to the core, but the core is creating positive change for a customer in a specific field. That is something different. You could say the core is I own a gym, so I always have to invest in new gyms and new machinery for the gym. Question is, is that the core? Maybe the core is becoming a healthy a partner in a healthy lifestyle. And then that gym is one of the items, but maybe a, a food nutrition line is also part of the core. So it depends on where you focus the core. And I think in the past, most organizations focused the core on their products. I like to focus the core on the customer. And then you have a totally different perspective to make that happen. But there's still a lot of work to do there. And, and I think that's the barrier for, uh, for really doing that because people want to stick to the core. And, but the problem is they look at it from a, a product point of view. Got that. We did talk about leadership. So I want to pull you into uh, metrics. So do metrics like NPS show true CX progress? And how can marketers get a company-wide buy into it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of NPS. I, I think that you need to measure and need to learn from that. And especially if you work on optimizing your touch points, I, I've seen beautiful cases where people really make a difference, really change a process. And then the week after that, almost, you see the impact on NPS, which is fantastic uh, because it motivates the teams that have been working on that. It motivates the organization to invest more in CX because they see the jump forward. So I think as an, as an instrumental tool, it really works. Um, just saying hooray against the score is something that I'm less a fan of because it, it means that you did a good job yesterday. It's like your report card. When your children come home with a report card, it means they did a good job yesterday. It, it, it isn't any guarantee for how the future will be. Uh, and, and it's not just about focusing on the metric. It's about understanding how you bring value to an organization, uh, to a customer. Um, I, it's, it's, it's an overused example, so my apologies for that. But if you think back to the Nokia days, ever, everyone had a Nokia in the world. And if you look at the net promoter score, customer satisfaction scores of Nokia, they were really high. People were actually extremely satisfied with their Nokia. But then the iPhone came and the value proposition of Nokia was gone. That was the problem. They didn't have unhappy customers. They didn't have a value proposition anymore. So MPS is one thing, but I think you need to add data next to that and understanding to make sure that what you bring to the market still brings enough value, not just today, also tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And then the second part of, of your question, how can you create a movement? How can, you how can you involve people? And I think that that's maybe the most crucial part of this question. Um, I, I know that a lot of leadership teams are working on NPS. It's part of their targets. And then you have the annual event uh, where the CEO presents the ambitions to the rest of the team. And then they're saying, dear colleagues, dear coworkers, we want to grow our NPS from plus 15 to plus 25. And the leadership team gets really excited, but the majority of, of, of the, the rest of the organization is like, whatever you're going to do, guys, just enjoy yourself with your NPS. So there's like a disconnect between how leadership looks at it and how the rest of the organization looks at it. The challenge is to make sure that every single individual, every single individual understands what their impact is on NPS. That means that if you have someone in HR, if you have someone in invoicing, you have someone working in the back office, explain them very in a very detailed way how they can contribute to MPS and what they need to change in their job to actually, at the end of the day, have a big impact on MPS. And the moment that you translate that back to what it means for every individual, that's the moment that it will start to, to work and that people will actually change their behavior. And, and you, know, you know, fixing that disconnect is hugely important. Great. Uh, I am getting nudges from the MC that we are in the final minutes. So finally, uh, Stephen, what is your CX trend prediction for 2022? We just have one minute. So I guess two predictions. All right. 
I'm, I'm looking forward to customer loyalty being reinvented. I think that customer loyalty, I mean, we, we've been doing that the same for the last 30 years. Uh, it's still with points. And if you get something, I mean, if you buy 10 breads, the 11 is for free. And now I think we're going to see a change of that. I think that we're going to see more a shared interest playing field. Uh, the whole evolution of NFTs, um, uh, digital assets that people can buy, where they can be part of an organization could change that. And so I think there are going to be a lot of new technologies that actually make sure that customer loyalty doesn't come from collecting points, but actually comes from the fact that you are almost part of the organization. And if the organization, if the brand is doing well, that you benefit from that and as a customer so that the value for the customer and the value for the organization for my loyalty is, is the same. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that one. And a second one, and I'm really excited about, it's a little bit futuristic, but I'm, I'm following it close hand, is the whole evolution of, of metaverse commerce. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been talking about it, Sachin Adela has been talking about it, and it's still early day, I realize that. But I think, for instance, that there's going to be a huge market for digital fashion. And question is, especially if you have a younger audience, as a brand, if maybe it's already smart to, to move into that world, and to have a, an, an early customer experience there. I've seen that Nike, for instance, uh, is really going for that, for digital fashion, so that people have their avatar that they can buy Nike stuff for that. And I mean, from a business perspective, it's huge. Yeah? You sell digital stuff, you don't need the production. There's, it's almost zero cost involved. It's pure branding that you're actually selling. You're monetizing the power of your brand in a digital way, which is extremely valuable as a business model but also towards the customers. I mean, if you are there as a first one and your brand becomes important and really popular in this digital world, it could have a plus in the physical world. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, it's a little bit day after tomorrow thinking, yes. but I like it. But definitely. And that is a wrap for our session. Thank you so much, Stephen, for these amazing insights. And thank you to our wonderful audience for the great questions. Aziza, over to you. Thank you so much, Ravi and Stephen, for that inspiring discussion for our viewers. And as an ex-marketeer, I have to say it was definitely one of my personal favorite sessions today.